Last. So, always a major issue in CF is infection. No matter how you look at it, it's always going to be a major issue. We're always uh, very much uh, mindful of it. And we thought it was a good idea to bring this all up to speed with where we are with infection control guidelines within the hospital and in our clinic. And Mimi is going to take on the task of uh, making this simple for everybody. Okay. So thank you. Well, thank you. So I'm Mimi Boo. I'm one of the um, instructors in pediatric pulmonary at our CF Center. And um, today I'm going to be talking about a couple things. So first of all, the fact that um, patients with cystic fibrosis can harbor microbes in the respiratory tract. And what really are microbes, so I'll cover that. That acquisition of certain organisms has been associated with rapid decline in pulmonary function. And which are those organisms we're interested in, just so that we're all on the same page. And that um, microbes can spread through direct contact from person to person, and also from ind indirect contact from the environment. So it's our, um, our role to give advice um, to our patients on how to limit the spread. And in our clinics and hospitals, we attempt to uh, prevent the spread of pathogens through our infection control policies, and I'll go over what those are. So um, there are uh, three main major categories of microbes that can be found in the respiratory tract. So the first one is bacteria, and the picture here is um, of Staphylococcus uh, aureus, and other um, other bacteria that you'll hear about um, for your patients and your children are Haemophilus influenza, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Bobozeria uh, cepacea, and non tuberculous kind of bacteria. Viruses, um, this is an electron microscopy of, a, uh, of influenza. And the two major viruses we think of are RSV, um, which we use as a medication called Synergis um, during the winter time, and influenza, which we recommend um, uh, vaccination against during the winter time as well. And the last category is um, fungi and molds. And one of the big players is Aspergillus fumigatus, and here is a, a, a microscope picture of that as well. So I'm going to go over some of the major um, bugs that you hear about just so that um, you can become familiar with them. So staph, uh, formerly known as um, staph Staphylococcus aureus, is the most com it's the most commonly isolated microbe in infants and children. Um, we only treat it when the patient actually exhibits um, primary symptoms, so if you're just positive on culture and don't have any symptoms, we don't treat it yet. So we um, treat it when there are symptoms. And then um, there is something called MRSA, which is methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, that um, is basically staph aureus that then develops a resistant to methicillin, which is an antibiotic. And it is um, detected in a quarter of patients by the time they're 18 years of age, and we do have antibiotics to treat this. Another big player is Pseudomonas, um, also known as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Mm -hmm. It is found all over in the environment, mm -hmm. in lakes, streams, moist so soil, and vegetables. And by 18 mm -hmm. years of age, about 50% of patients are po have a uh, culture positive for Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas is important in the CF world because, um, because chronic infections with Pseudomonas create what we call biofilm, which is a, um, a layer of, um, of a layer that is both mixed with um, uh, proteins as well as the, the bacteria itself. So it's very hard for um, antibiotics to actually get into that layer and eradicate the um, pseudomonas once it's in the lungs. In addition, pseudomonas has been associated with inflammation and progressive lung disease, um, which includes mucus pelagine and bronchiectasis. It's associated with poor lung function, worse chest imaging, and, in and increased um, symptoms. So, um, pseudomonas can be a uh, bad word in the um, CFO. What's even more worrisome is, is, is another bacteria called cepacea, and the formal name is um, Bocroderia cepacea. It's found in our environment as well, in soil, water, and plants. And the acquisition of patients usually occur later in life, later in their CF disease. And the good thing about cepacea is that only a small minority of patients ever get cepacea, about less than 10% of all patients with CF and even in that ten, less than 10 percent, only a small subset will ha, um, will have bad disease. But in the in this small subset of patients, there is a really rapid decline in lung function. So it's a bug that a lot of people fear in this community. Then there's something called NTM, which is non tuberculous non tuberculous uh, mycobacteria, another another organism that's found all over in the environment 
in um, soil, streams, rivers, and water. And there are many different types of macrobacteria that we don't really know what the consequence is if you're positive for it. However, there is one um, macrobacteria called Macrobacteria abscessus that has been associated with rapid decline in primary function and we will treat aggressively here at our center. One of the fungi that I'd like to just touch base upon is Aspergillus, formerly known as Aspergillus fumigatus. Again, it's found all over in the, in the environment, in soil, plants. And um, sp spores can be released into the air um, by aerosolization with certain activities such as construction. And it's associated with an allergic response for, your, for, for the body to um, the aspergillus called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, also known as ADPA. Um, and untreated ADPA can lead to bronchiectasis and pulmonary fibrosis. But rarely does it cause actual invasive disease in the lung before um, active infection. So how do these germs, how do germs spread in general? So there are three main mechanisms of spread. So the first mechanism is contact. So that's direct contact from person to person or contact with a contaminated object or surface such as a table surface, a doorknob, um, things like that. And the, the, the types of organisms that get spread by contact are bacteria and viruses. Another way of um, germ spreading is by droplet. And so droplet is when uh, droplets of, of, of liquid get formed through talking, through coughing, or through sneezing that's shown in this um, photo. And these little droplets can travel up to three to um, six feet through the air. And the most common organisms that, um, that, that spread by droplet is viruses such as influenza. And then the last category is airborne. And what airborne means is that these um, Microscopic microbes can actually be found on dust or particles that are suspended in the air. And um, these um, microbes can be float, can float in the air for a very long, um, long period of time. And um, examples of this are mycobacteria and aspergillus um, that can just float on little um, dust particles in the air. And for most people who will have intact immune systems who are healthy, a mycobacterium aspergillus doesn't really do anything to you, but then in CF patients, Any questions so far? Okay. So what do we do for, so knowing these things, knowing the, um, the microbes and knowing how these microbes can spread, what do we do to protect um, our patients with CF um, from these um, microorganisms? So there are both standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. And we apply our infection control um, guidelines to all patients with CF, regardless of what your culture actually shows, because what you have this phenom culture and a gag culture may not actually represent what's going on in their lungs. So it's not individually based. Uh, the, the infection control for CF patients is not individually based. So we have um, infection control guidelines for a clinic. And so for the clinic visit itself, I'll go over what we do. So for coming to clinic, um, so one of the things we're really concerned about is all the construction that's going around on um, LPs, LPs stage right now. And as I mentioned, there is um, with construction, you can cause airborne um, uh, distribution of things like aspergillus and mycobacterium into the air. So we're recommending that patients come to the clinic to have their, their car windows rolled up and have the air in the car, in the car be recirculated so you're not having any fresh air come into the car um, as you're approaching the um, clinic. And then um, from the car to going into the clinic, into your clinic room, you should be wearing an N95 mask. And these are two pictures of um, different NMMS that we have available. In the waiting room itself, what we recommend, uh, what, we, what we have done is to have CF patients be approved as fast as possible. But if they are waiting, then they should be wearing a mask, um, both in clinic or um, at the hospital. That's where you are. To maintain, some, maintain something called a three-foot um, rule, meaning you maintain at least three feet away from another, other, any other patient, so that way, you minimize the risk of any droplet spread. So I'm, as I said, said before, droplets can um, travel three to six feet. So that's the amount of space you want to keep from other people. During the clinic visit, um, each patient has their own room. And, um, uh, and you'll see that when we come into the clinic to examine you, most, most of the physicians will look like this, maybe without the actual hair piece, mm -hmm. but a, a mask, a gown, and gloves. And so the reason is, um, we're trying to 
trying to limit the spread by contact, by direct contact. So we have all the, any, anyone who enters the room needs to wear gloves. Um, they also need to do hand hygiene um, prior um, to donning on the gloves, which includes, which can either be using 60% alcohol um, gel that you slather in your hands for 10 to 15 minutes, or you wash your hands for 10 to 15 minutes, and I'll go over what good hand washing is. In addition, um, uh, we encourage people to wear masks if you're going to be within three feet of the patient, and if you're, you, you should wear, a, you will wear a white, I'm sorry, the yellow gowns if you're actually going to touch them. So what is actually good hand washing? So number one, you want to wash your hands with um, warm water. And this is good for both the hospital and outside of the hospital as well. You want to apply soap and liquid and antibacterial soap is the best and that's recommended by the CDC. You rub your hands together to lather it. You want to scrub your hands well, front, back, in between the fingers, underneath the nail, up to your elbows, up, like up your wrists if, uh, if possible, and um, you should be washed, lathering for at least then you rinse with warm water, you dry with a clean towel or a paper towel so that we know it's not been touched by another person. And you actually use a paper towel to, um, to turn off the faucet so you don't be contaminated. <coughs> and then after the clinic visit, once the patient's already left, I just want to let you know what we actually do to the room. Um, so the exam room and all the touch surfaces are um, wiped by a detergent germicide by our clinic staff. The exam tables are thoroughly disinfected every day by our um, housekeeping. The, the floors are cleaned daily, so that's one thing to know, especially for children, patients, I mean, uh, parents with toddlers who are on the floor. Those floors will only be cleaned in between patients if there's more, uh, visible soilage, but otherwise, someone can pass it through. Um, all the respiratory devices are cleaned thoroughly and dis disinfected between, uh, between the patients, and all disposable things such as the filters we use on the spirometer are um, disposed. questions about what happens in clinic? Yeah. I just have to say, after all these months of construction and local clinic visits, this is the first time I've ever heard about keeping the windows up and the circulation on the car and wearing the mask from the car. So it just, to me, is a heads up of, for all parents of thinking for us to get the word out. Thanks, Thanks for reminding people. Pardon? Thanks for the time. It was a simple before we broke around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Well, it's, like, yeah. it's, not, it's a great reminder to us because I think we were so vigilant at the beginning and now that we're on yeah. year two. Well, yeah, and I think that even, even for people who've been told, yeah. you know, yeah. that just a reminder to everybody. That's if you're right. rushing in clinic, you're late, you may not think. I think so. a good idea would be to put like a stop and wait sign before um, to the desk. So we read the steps of, so everybody knows like, really what they need to do. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think we actually had a letter that was um, sent out to families early on. All right, so what happens during the hospital stay? So a lot of what happens in the clinic actually do in the hospital as well. So as you, um, for any of you who have been hospitalized, um, each patient gets a private room, and within that room, there are um, dedicated patient equipment. So the uh, stethoscopes are um, dedicated to the patient. All the, um, the IV poles, the the airway clearance machines are for that patient, left for that patient for the entire hospital stay. Um, equipment, other toys that are brought into that room also will be completely disinfected before they are removed from that room. And the dis disinfectant wipes should be in every room so that way it's easily accessible. And this sign is very familiar for patients who've been through, um, had CF and been in the hospital that every door for our CF patient will have this and we'll talk about contact and droplet precautions. So the same thing, um, all providers that come into the room um, who will actually contact the patient will, will wear a gown, they'll wear a mask if um, they're within three feet of the patient, um, gloves if you enter the room, and then um, hand hygiene that I already went over. Some things that are um, unique to the hospital experience here at um, LPCH is that the patients must remain in their room. And that's because of the um, construction that's going on around campus. Um, patients are not allowed to go into outdoor areas, onto the gardens, nor the roof because of all the um, construction that's going on. And so the patient themselves must remain in the room. And unfortunately, patients may, may not attend any of the great community programs that LPCH has available, um, school, the playrooms, and other community recreation activities. 
we try to uh, make up for this by having child life, uh, child life specialists as well as the school teachers visit um, the patient's room and, uh, and give um, specific things to fit the patient's needs. In addition, we have occupational therapy and physical therapy come to the room to provide activities to, for the uh, patient to do during the hospital stay. Still. One very important thing is that the CF patients may not may, are not allowed to co-mingle in person with other CF patients, although they're very tempted to. And they may not um, co-mingle with other immunized, immunocompromised patients. And I, I don't think that we kept track of this, but CIP, and siblings and visitors of the CF patients and their parents are not allowed to attend communities as well. So not allowed to go to the play room, not allowed to go to preschool, you have a sibling. Um, so those things um, are really important. And when the patient leaves the, um, leaves the hospital, things you know, so you can know all the equipment that's in the room is completely disinfected, all the IV poles, the respiratory um, equipment, the um, room itself, once the patient leaves, goes under a terminal B, which includes those curtains that are in the room at the time of discharge as well. So the room is completely disinfected. So just to recap, um, the, there is acquisition, acquisition of certain, certain microbes that has been associated with um, progressive lung disease in CF. And we know that microbes can be um, spread through both direct contact and indirect contact. And because of this knowledge, we have these infection control policies um, for your clinical visits and your hospital space. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is the difference between clinic and the inpatient. In the clinic, people you know it is such a big topic. People are so careful. Um, the hospital sometimes doesn't feel quite as much, and I guess as as a care provider, how uh, do you empower? You know, how can we help empower patients, in particular, or, you know, young adults, teens and young adults, to just feel comfortable checking in with whatever nurse, housekeeping staff, physician, whoever is in there, if they're not sure they clean their hands. I can tell you, my daughter has had that one, and maybe they have, maybe they haven't, but she feels very insecure because she's hyper aware of infection control. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in terms of the team, it, it sort of has to come from the team to say, it's okay to ask. It's, you know, there's, you, it's not offensive to ask. It's better to, to check in. So, do you have any tips to share about, you know, phrasing that might not? <laughs> I don't know. I'm such a direct person that I would agree with you to say, ask if you have any concern that someone can wash their hands. You should ask that person because it's close on the doors, close in all over the hospital, especially for hand hygiene. It's audited. I mean, all the all healthcare providers in the hospital are audited with their hand washing. And so it wouldn't be surprising for a patient to ask, did you wash your hands? And I, I don't find it. It is not very consistent. I mean, I had a recent experience of sterilization, and a lot of times I have to say, excuse me, could you put the gloves? Um, because they were not. Or sometimes they say, this is a special cup for your daughter, and uh, they will come in with their own. So I would just hand in the other one they say, this is the one that you should be using, but they have already been using the other one. So there are certain things that I don't know, and you feel bad because you feel like, okay, you're policing everything and you may not do it right. So it's a little concerning. So maybe like a pamphlet like this that you can refer and say, okay, this is what I was called, and maybe having some written back up that will help you, I think it will be important. But no, they didn't give me anything at the hospital saying these are the rules and you shouldn't be reinforcing this. Because I know everybody's busy and running and nobody has bad intentions, but sometimes it happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes people forget to do whatever is um, uh, mandated of them. But I think that yeah. uh, just as you notice and need to be re re reminded, we sometimes need to be reminded as well. Yeah. Yeah. But the practitioner doesn't, uh, shouldn't mind but um, children, you need to be direct. You know, I think there is some some phrase or some way for the patient to say that. Um, I, I saw it somewhere. Maybe we could make a handout and put it in the CF binder. Mm -hmm. So then it could be a script that the patient and we actually we should do that. The yeah. advisory council, that little infection control worker does have, I think, some suggested phrases. And I guess I'm trying to be really kind about the way I ask. I guess what I'm saying is 
I think the CF team and clinic, because we know you and trust you and trust our relationship, to just reinforce with parents and kids, listen, it's always okay to ask, or if they're going inpatient, it's always okay to say that, to reinforce from the people who are providing the care. Maybe not can. less about the, it's not about the clinic people per se, but once it's inpatient, I think most of us feel very insecure, because it is, it is different. And there are protocols, yes, but we all know that vigilance is important. Maybe sometimes people look like instead of saying, did you wash your hands, maybe it's like, could you please, I'm sorry, could you please wear gloves? You know what I mean? So then the person's not questioned if they, you know what I mean, if they did something or not, then they're like on the defense, you know what I mean? Something like, so the gloves are sitting right there, I'm sorry, could you please use gloves? You know, something like that, where it's, you're not, you know, putting the person on the spot. Yeah, that's a good idea, though. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Putting on gloves, you also need to still wash your hands. Yeah. But I think it's um, point taken. I think that the 